And so today we recognize Morehouse as a global resource for educated and ethical leaders. And right now, the mantra I'm using at Morehouse, the 3,000 young men who are on our campus, as well as the 16,000 living alumni who are around the nation and the world, is that Morehouse is committed to preparing Renaissance men with social conscience and global perspective. Just those 10 words represent my vision and my mantra. We'll prepare Renaissance men with social conscience and global perspective. And then to move from vision to operationalizing, there are five specific attributes that we look at. You see, all of our goals need to be SMART gold, goals, S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time limited. In, in an effort to make this vision smart and operational, we look at, number one, teaching them to become well-read. I ask, what's on your bookshelf? Do you have a broad array of texts? Are you encountering knowledge in the sciences if you're an artist? Or if you're a business student, do you understand the principal uh, uh, ideas and texts in physics and math? So it's a broadening of the Renaissance person. Well-read. Second, well-spoken. Read first and then speak. Have something to say. Well spoken. <laughs> third, well traveled. And this is a part of the agenda and the third point I'll make before I conclude, the importance of internationalizing all of our college students in America today, enabling them to take advantage of what President Obama is calling for, that America is again ready to encounter the world, ready to listen, ready to learn, ready to lead. Well read, well spoken, well traveled, well dressed. I know the parents in the audience appreciate this point. Some young people do and some don't. But I like to tell the men of Morehouse, long before people encounter your dynamic intelligence and the brilliance of your conversation, they see you first. You make that impression. So I said, guys, don't turn people off in the first five seconds. So show up ready to play, ready to lead. Walk the walk, talk the talk, look the part of a leader. Pull your pants up, take your hat off, and show women respect. Well read, well spoken, well traveled, well dressed, and well balanced. Balance. That's the one that challenges every one of us today, isn't it? Even us adults. Balance in our lives. Dr. W.B. Du Bois, the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard, said, My life. My time in Atlanta University and at Fisk were years of hard work and hard play. And I try to tell the students we want healthy minds within healthy bodies governed by healthy values. And so the, the, the goal of balance is very important for us to strive toward. This third and final point. The challenge, the opportunity now to internationalize. In other words, for all of us to become globalists. For all of us to know more about the world out there that's hoping that America will notice again and America will care. There's a wonderful thought exercise that says if you take the concurrent world's population and you shrink that to 100 people with all of the existing human demographic ratios remaining the same, this is not what we might look like but what there, what there actually would be within this model. 100 people. There'd be 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 from North and South America, 8 Africans, 52 would be female, 48 male, 70 would be darker skinned people, 30 white people, 70 would be from a religious tradition other than Christianity, 30 would be Christian, 89 would be heterosexual, 11 homosexual. 59% of the entire world's wealth would belong to only six people, and all six would be citizens of the United States. 80 would live in substandard housing. 70, 70 would be unable to read. 50 would suffer from malnutrition. One would be near death, one would be near birth, and only one would have a college education. Only one would have a computer. And then it concludes, when one considers our world from such a compressed perspective, 
the need for both acceptance and understanding becomes glaringly apparent, end quote. It seems to me that is, in fact, the educational and the ethical imperative of globalization, to grapple with how we prepare ourselves by being Renaissance women and Renaissance men for the challenge of a global environment. Dr. King offers enormous wisdom on this topic, and I urge you to read the last book he wrote was titled, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? But in that last book of Dr. King's in 1968, the last chapter of the last book is the most important in my view. That chapter is titled, The World House. And in it, he describes a picture of a family widely separated by ideas, and they inherit a single house in which they have to live. I always think this sounds like the premise for a reality show. But it really is the reality we now face. And he talks about some of the ethical imperatives of our living together in this small world. Well, four or five points to just to offer a brief word of, uh, of assurance that America's colleges and universities are stepping up to the plate. A recent report by the Forum for the Future of Higher Education indicates the following. Colleges and universities are, in fact, expanding our international recruitment efforts to attract more students from the world to study in our extraordinary schools. Currently, only 3% of American college populations are comprised of students from elsewhere in the world, international students, 3%. We need to grow that number. At Morehouse's campus, we're doing some very exciting things, and we've devoted an entire dormitory to the international house and the international mission, sponsoring programs every week, every month, to internationalize the rest of the campus. Second, American students are being invited increasingly to travel and study abroad. We think this is very important. Right now, only 1% of American students study abroad. And the fact is, African American and Hispanic students are studying abroad at rather dramatically lower rates than their white counterparts. We need to change this. Although, a note of hope, David Arnold, president of American University in Cairo, indicates he's seen a recent quadrupling of interest and presence of American stu students studying Middle Eastern languages there in Cairo. Third, colleges are retooling courses, teaching American history from a more international perspective, bringing new texts into the classroom. Fourth, our faculty are increasingly more diverse and international. At Morehouse, we're hiring uh, teachers and professors from Africa and Asia. We have just hired one terrific uh, Chinese language professor. She is dynamic and charismatic, and suddenly everybody wants to learn Chinese at Morehouse. And just one professor has made the difference. So again, I urge you to uh, support the efforts of Cleveland State University, support the efforts of Wilberforce and all the terrific schools in this city and in this state as they launch further out into this international arena. In addition, there are a number of exciting campus-led movements to establish an American university presence in other parts of the world. And time doesn't permit, but you should look at what's happening in Doha, Qatar, in a place called Education City. And you essentially are getting the replication of Ivy League schools there in the Middle East, with millions of dollars being invested and in major universities. And Morehouse wants to establish a presence in the Middle East because we think that what we've done with young African American men can and should be done with young Middle Eastern men and young Muslim men, transforming the image, preparing moderate, thoughtful leaders that I think can serve the global community in a positive way. Well, our president has given us a challenge. I think we have an opportunity to respond. And as we do, I hope you'll hold a good thought for Morehouse, for Spelman, for all 105 of our HBCUs. And remember the words of Rabbi Hillel, who said, the world is equally balanced between good and evil. Your next act will tip the scale. Thank you for listening. Thank you.